Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 33, The Great Embassy, Part 2. First off, Happy New Year to all my listeners. You know, when I started this project last April, I would have been overjoyed to start the new year with three or 4,000 subscribers and listeners. But what's transpired has way outstripped my grandest expectations, as we've just passed the 45,000 subscriber mark. Thanks to all of you for making this such a fun project. I really couldn't have done it without all the support and great messages you've sent me in the past year. Hopefully, I can continue to improve the product I deliver to you each week and enrich your knowledge bank on the subject of Russian history through its rulers. Another note, you may have noticed that uh, we didn't publish the podcast until today, uh, Monday, and that's going to be the new schedule so I can really work at it over the weekends. Uh, my business is starting to pick up in my personal life, so I'm going to have a little less time during the week to work on this, and the weekends are going to be my kind of free time. So every Monday is when this podcast will be coming out, and I hope uh, that works out for everyone. Now, on to the show. Last time, we saw the beginning of one of the world's grandest odysseys, known as the Great Embassy, led by Peter the Great, along with 250 of his fellow cohorts from Moscow. He made a lot of good friends along the way, though, like Sophia in Hanover and William of Orange, but was unsuccessful in his attempts to gain allies against the Russians' main enemy, the Turks. Peter had spent a total of almost five months in Holland, much of which was spent learning how to build ships, but the Tsar began to become restless and a bit annoyed at his Dutch hosts. He was frustrated at the lack of science that the Dutch used in building their ships. He yearned for more, and he knew where to head to to learn from the best. He needed to go to England. But first, he needed a way in, and he got it in a big way. Now, before moving on, Peter sent word to Russia, and in particular Voronezh, that all Dutch shipbuilders were to be demoted and not be allowed to build without being overseen by any English Danish, or Venetian shipbuilders. Now, Peter had sent envoys to England to ask the king for safe passage to the island, and what he got in return was more than he could have imagined. He was not only allowed to come to London, but he would do it in grand style aboard one of two warships sent to bring him, a ship called the York, which he boarded on January 7, 1698, and he left most of his troop behind. He took just a few men, um, one prominent one being Menshikov, who he began to become quite close to. While not quite as wealthy as Amsterdam yet, London was one of the most populated cities in the entire world. It had over 750,000 inhabitants. It was, you know, like most places in Europe, pretty dirty and uh, dangerous. The England Peter visited was on the brink of becoming the world's most dominant power, much of, it, much of it due to his success against the French in the fight that was to come a few years later, known as the War of the Spanish Secession. Now, arriving on January 11, 1698, Peter stayed at a small and kind of nondescript house near the Thames River. The Tsar met with William of Orange a number of times, also being introduced to his daughter, Princess Anne, who would succeed William four years later. It was here that a portrait of Peter said to be a stunning likeness by Sir Godfrey Knellner, was painted. You can see it on both the podcast site for this episode or on the Russian Rulers History Facebook fan site. The Tsar roamed the streets of London wherever he could, looking into all sorts of businesses like watchmakers, mills, and, of course, shipyards. Peter and his entourage moved into a new house owned by one John Evelyn, which was large enough to hold the entire group. Evelyn was to regret the decision, though, to let Peter and his troops stay in his house. They basically acted like drunken boys on spring break as they trashed the house beyond recognition. As Evelyn Stewart was to write, quote, There is a house full of people and right nasty. The Tsar lives next to the library and dines in the parlor next to your study. He dines at 10 o'clock and at 6 at night is seldom at home a whole day, very often in the king's yard or by water, dressed in several dresses. The king is expected here this day. 
The best parlor is pretty clean for him to be entertained in. The king pays for all he, the Tsar, has. Unquote. They stayed in the house for three months before moving on. Now here, Peter and his followers were beginning to become aware that they were pretty much flat broke and needed some quick cash. A tobacco merchant named Carmathon made the Tsar an offer. Give us a monopoly to transport tobacco into Russia, and we'll pay you 28,000 British pounds, a hefty sum in the day. Peter jumped at the deal, which must have angered the Russian Orthodox Church back in Moscow, as they viewed tobacco as the devil's creation. But Peter viewed it as a way to rile the church and make Russia more Western. Still, the main purpose of the great embassy was to strengthen the alliances against the Turks. But Peter was not succeeding with William. William needed to have peace with the Turks because his focus was solely on stopping Louis the Fourteenth. The Tsar, though, needed to achieve some successes before returning to Moscow, so he headed off to Vienna, leaving London on May 2nd. He enjoyed his days in, Lo in London, learning much, especially about shipbuilding, so he was saddened when he was forced to head off. From London, the small group met up with the larger one in Amsterdam, who had good news for the Tsar. They had recruited 640 Dutchmen to go to Russia, who numbered among them shipbuilders, physicians, engineers, and more. The great embassy now headed off to Vienna through Leipzig, Dresden, and Prague. In Dresden, Peter met with Augustus of Saxony, who was also now the friendly king of Poland as Augustus II. Augustus was not there to greet the Tsar, as he was in Poland solidifying his control of power. So basically what he did is he met with the people who were surrounding Augustus in Saxony. Then Peter arrived in Vienna, where he was struck by the difference this major city in Amsterdam and London, as this was not a port city, and you could tell the difference in wealth. Not a poor city at all. It struck Peter that he was right about building a navy and using shipping to build wealth. Leopold I was the Holy Roman Emperor, a member of the Habsburg dynasty, with Vienna being the seat of his government. Leopold considered himself above all others in Europe, with the possible exception of the Pope. Great banquets were held in the honor of the two men. Peter the tall man with boundless energy, still in his twenties, and Leopold having already reigned for forty years, small and old. They hit it off quite well, though, but the mission, alas, did not succeed here, which really surprised the Tsar, as this was the one city which was besieged by the Turks just a few years before, and they were saved by General Jan Sobieski. But what Peter found out was the Turks had offered a peace treaty that was beneficial to the Habsburgs, but not to Russia. It was clear Russia was going to have to go at it against the Turks alone. Now the embassy was headed south to Venice, and then hopefully to Rome where the Tsar could visit the resting place of his namesake, St. Peter. Just as they were ready to depart, a disturbing message reached them with news that four regiments of the Streltsy were in revolt and only sixty miles from Moscow. Peter and his group were aghast, as nothing else was in the message, and they were fearful that Sophia had seized power and the life of the legitimate Tsar was hanging in the balance. Peter wrote the following note to Roma Donovsky, whom he left in charge. Quote, I have received your letter in which you grace in your in which your grace writes that the seed of Ivan Mikhailovich is sprouting. I beg you to be severe. No other way is it possible to put out the flame. Although we are sorry to give up our present profitable business, yet for the sake of this we shall be with you sooner than you think. On July 19th, the Tsar headed off towards Moscow at a breakneck pace, stopping only to eat and change horses. In Krakow, he was met with a message that General Sheen had defeated the rebels and had many of them executed or imprisoned. He thought about turning back, but Peter had much to attend to, and he kept on, although at a much slower pace. 
Peter then physically met with another giant of a man, Augustus, the king of Poland. This was to be the beginning of a long-term friendship, as well as a strong ally in a war that was to start shortly because of the meeting between the two men. But it was not the war that Peter had envisioned when he started the embassy 18 months earlier. It was an enemy to the north that they would battle for many years to come. But we'll get into that next week. On September 4th, 1698, Peter entered Moscow. What he was to start doing from that moment on was to shake the very foundations of Russian society, and he knew that it had to be done. If the people of Russia would not embrace the new information pouring into the country and change voluntarily, he would beat it into them. Within days of his return, he started to shave the beards of men with his own hands, starting with General Sheen. He had every boyar in the area shaved until all but three were clean-shaven. What Peter had done was to make it clear that the old ways were over, and no one should dare oppose him, and none did. Patriarch Adrian had once admonished Tsar Alexis when he began to relax laws about shaving, when he said, quote, Shaving is not only foolishness and dishonor, it is a mortal sin. Now the Tsar made his message clear. If you want my favor, don't dare come in front of me with a beard. He basically said the old ways of Mother Russia were over. The country and all its citizens were to move into the modern Western world. A new law was put into place that allowed Russian officials to forcefully shave the beard off any man they encountered. Only priests and peasant serfs were allowed to keep their beards. Great consternation greeted the order, as it was considered a sin to be beardless. But the Tsar, uh, he saw a tax opportunity, whereby a man could keep his beard for an annual fee. But anyone who wished to be in the presence of Peter had better be beardless, or he would actually rip it off forcefully. Next was the forced change of clothing from the long flowing robes to a more western style. Within five years, Moscow was noted by visiting ambassadors to be similar in dress to any European city. His will was being enforced in a rapid and forceful manner. Next, Peter had to take charge of his personal life and rid himself of the wife he had grown to despise, Eudosha. At first, he had asked that the men he had left in charge convince the Tsarista to become a nun and renounce her life with the Tsar. When that failed, Peter tried to intimidate her and force her to take the veil. When that didn't work, he simply took her son Alexis away from her and had her taken to the Pokrovsky Monastery in Suzdal, where her head was shaven and locked away. Next week, we see how Peter deals with the rebellious remainder of the old Russians, the Turks and the beginning of the Great Northern War, against one of the most feared army of the early 1700s, that of Charles XII, the King of Sweden. Now, for this week in Russian history for the two-week period of December 26th through the January 9th, or 8th, excuse me. In 1076, we have Prince Yatoslav II of Kiev dying. In 1481, Ahmed Khan, the Khan of the Golden Horde, the last remnant of the Mongols to control Russia, was assassinated. In 1598, Boris Gudinov became Tsar of Russia. In 1700, under orders from Peter the Great, Russia began using the Anno Domini era and no longer used the Anno Mundi era of the Byzantine Empire. What that meant was January 1st was now to be the beginning of the new year and not September 1st, which is the way the old Russians did it. In 1709, Empress Elizabeth of Russia, daughter of Peter the Great, and Catherine I was born during this period in 1762. Oh, excuse me, the daughter of Peter the Great and Catherine I uh, passed away in 1762, but she was born in 1709. In 1806, we have the Battle of Pulutsk and Golyamin, where Russian forces held French held against the French forces under Napoleon. 
1905, we had the Russo-Japanese War, and it's where the Russian garrison surrendered at Port Arthur, China. Uh, if you're interested about this, uh, the history according to Bob, Bob Packett, had a nice little series on the Russo-Japanese War, in particular the Battle of Port Arthur, which was really fascinating. In 1916, Grigory Rasputin, the Russian monk who was a favorite of the court of Nicholas II, was murdered. And that is a fascinating period of time and how uh, Rasputin was murdered and how they had to shoot him, poison him, and drown him in order to kill him. In 1922, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is formed. And during this period in 1991, it was dissolved. In 1979, the Soviet Union invaded the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. And in 1999, Boris Yeltsin, the first president of Russia, resigned, leaving Prime Minister Vladimir Putin as the acting president. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to visit the iTunes App Store and download the Russian Rulers app. And please visit the websites at russianrulers.podhoster.com Become a Facebook friend at Russian Rulers History Podcast. Don't forget to ask a question, make a suggestion, and please leave a comment. And as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.